Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, May 10th, 2020. We're in Lesson 11 of the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly Commentary, also the Standard Commentary. Uh, we are also in Unit 3, which is entitled Call to God's Work of Justice. Call to God's Work of Justice. Lesson title from the quarterly uh, is A New Day is Coming. Our devotional reading is taken from Zechariah chapter 8, verses 18 to 23. Our background scripture, the entire chapter 8 of Zechariah. And our printed or lesson passage is taken from Zechariah 8, one, verses 1 to 8, and then 11 to 17. Uh, the key verse is verse 15, uh, which reads, So again, have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, fear ye not. Lesson aims or number one, comprehend the impact of God's presence in a community Number two, yearn for God's perpetual presence and the promise of justice it brings. Now, we know we have God's perpetual presence in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit, those of us who are, have trusted in Christ. And then number three, uh, pray for God's presence to result in a communal sense of justice, prosperity, and unity. The quarterly lesson has three major divisions. The first is a new status. That's covered between chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. The second is reversed fortunes, covered between verses 11 and 13. And finally, divine confirmation, covered between verses 14 and 17. Uh, from the standard commentary, I know some of you use that as well. Lesson title is Promising Peace. Promising Peace. Very quickly, additional aims or describe the expression of the peace that God promises. Number two, explain why jealousy is not a sin or character defect when applied to God. And then number three, write a couplet that the, that dedicates his or her life to embracing God's new normal. Standard lesson has two major commentaries, I'm sorry, major divisions rather. The first is stability, covered between verses 1 and 8 of chapter 8, and the second is prosperity, covered between chapter 8 verses 11 and 17. Uh, we're going to try to be brief in... Uh, giving background on this lesson. Um, there's a lot to be said about the background to put it in proper context, but we are going to try to be brief. But before we do that, let's just go before the throne uh, with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. Lord, even in the midst of these trying times, Lord, um, we know that you are in control. You're in full control. And we thank you, Lord, that we can rest in your peace, the peace that passes understanding. And that as we remember uh, your word from Philippians uh, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make our requests known and the peace of God with, with thanksgiving and the peace of God, which passes understanding, will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We thank you that we can have this peace um, in the midst of this this great pandemic, and Lord, we know that you're in control and that you will stay it, Lord, when you accomplish your will through it. We just pray for those who have suffered uh, physically, have lost loved ones. We pray for the uh, first responders. Uh, we pray uh, for those who have been Im impacted financially, Lord. We pray that you would bless and restore. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to uh, begin with a little background, as I said. Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, was a contemporary of Haggai. 
uh, and they were called to uh, to prophesy to begin prophecy around 520 BC and to the uh, the exiles that had returned from Babylonian captivity to Judah. Uh, Zechariah uh, was from a priestly family, son of Berechiah, a grandson of Ido, who was a uh, a priest, and uh, so we know he was of a priestly family, and uh, his prophecies paralleled Haggai's to a point, but went beyond Haggai's more practical and immediate uh, uh, exhortation uh, that uh, uh, the uh, the the ex the returned uh, Jews continue to rebuild the temple. Uh, the when the uh, Jews returned uh, or the remnant returned to Judah, uh, they laid the foundation of the temple uh, right away. Uh, that was around five thirty six B C. And then, uh, again, I'm going to try to con condense the background. The peoples around them, the the different uh, people groups uh, around them, complained. They were they were concerned that uh, if uh, the Jews rebuilt the city, uh, they were going to be a threat to them. And of course, they wrote uh, a letter to the king then Artaxerxes. And and uh, t and told him, hey, these people are rebuilding the wall. They're rebuilding the city, and they. Uh, if you searched your records, you'll find out, or you searched the king's uh, records, you'll find out that they have been a rebellious people in the past, and that's why they were destroyed and so forth. And so Artaxerxes put a halt to any reconstruction of the city at that time, and uh, so sixteen years passed. And nothing had been done uh, beyond the laying of the foundation for the temple. And during that time, uh, the people built themselves houses. They uh, they tried to get on with a normal life. Uh, and we can read about what they did in Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. And I may go there and pull a few verses from that uh, from that passage. But God was not pleased with them carrying on with their lives, living in sealed houses, and and His house uh, be, ha, had been neglected. So, they the basically He cursed the land and would not let it produce. Uh, he withheld the rain, uh, and uh, basically they struggled uh, during this time uh, while the temple essentially remained uh, uncompleted. And by the way, that account of uh, the uh, ceasing of the work on the temple can be read in uh, Ezra chapter 4. Um, you can read, um, well, just read the entire chapter, but in verse uh, verses 21 through 24, uh, you'll see how Artaxerxes gave the command to cease the work. And verse 24 says, Then ceased the work. Uh, of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, so so ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Darius succeeded Artaxerxes, and the temple uh, reconstruction uh, resumed in 520 B.C. 520 B.C. in the time of of Zechariah's prophecy that we're going to be studying today is believed to have been right around 518 B.C. So we're right um, a couple of years into the uh, uh, rebuilding of the temple. It was completed in 515 B.C. So they completed it in five years after they resumed work. And so God is... is um, that that's kind of the backdrop. <clears throat> God is speaking to the fact that He is going to uh, return. His presence is going to be among His people, and that being symbolized by the temple, uh, by Him being in the midst of the temple, um, and 
and, and he offers promises to them of uh, blessings and restoration. Uh, and we're going to, and some of them obviously are near future intended uh, for those who had returned from Babylon or their descendants. Uh, and some of them are uh, yet to be fulfilled, their future yet. Okay. And uh, we'll try to uh, try to distinguish as we go through uh, God's uh, God's word here. Now, you know, as always, uh, we, I do, I try to ask the question uh, before I study a lesson and while I'm studying it even, you know, what, what does it say? What does it mean? And what does it mean to me? Or what does it mean to us? How do I apply this uh, to my life, to my Christian walk? And uh, this is, again, a historical narrative, but God gives uh, information that is beneficial for us in these historical narratives. He reveals uh, his character to us. Uh, he reveals his patience. He reveals his love. He reveals his concern. He reveals his power. He reveals his provision. He reveals a lot to us. And so I, I asked myself a few questions at the outset of the study or after I was in the midst of the study, I should say, you know, what does God's restoration look like? I mean, what does it look like uh, in our lives? You know, what does it mean to have God in our midst? And we know we uh, born again believers in Christ are indwelt by his spirit. He is in us. He walks in us and we are his people and he is our God. And then number three, how should uh, we respond to God's protection, his care, uh, and uh, and being uh, him being in our midst? You know, what 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 kind of response does that require from us? Uh, and then um, and then obviously we see th throughout the lesson uh, more of God's character. What does the lesson teach us about God's God's character, his faithfulness to his people, his power and his provision for them? Now, with that as a little background, let's start with our our first passage, our first <clears throat> uh, division here from the quarterly. And I do want to point out one typo for those of you who read the biblical context in the quarterly. Um, the writer says that the temple had been laid, the temple foundation rather, had been laid in 586 B.C., uh, he meant 536 B.C. That was a, a typo there. And, of course, it was completed in 515 B.C. He, ha he has that correct. But otherwise, I think his commentary is, is really on point here. Um, so the first division, a new status, verses 1 to 8. Um, I'm going to read from the KJV, but I will be perhaps going back and forth between the NIV and the KJV for better uh, clarity. Uh, verse 1, again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus said the Lord of hosts, there shall yet, there shall yet old men and women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem and every man with his staff in his hand for very, for, old, for very age rather. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus said the Lord of hosts, If it is be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of the people in these days, should it also be marvelous in my eyes, said the Lord of hosts? Verse 7, Thus said the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. That's verse 8. 
All right, we're going to jump right in here and back up to verse 1 and have some verse-by-verse -verse commentary here, discussion. Verse 1 again reads, Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying... Now, that, that's part... That, that's verse A, rather. I mean, sorry, uh, verse 1. Um... Uh, that's a common way of prophets uh, introducing what they're about to say, which came from the Lord. Uh, what Zechariah adds, which is not common, is he, uh, he addresses God as the Lord of hosts, or Saboeth, or Sabioth, depending on how you pronounce it, the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of might, the mighty God, speaking of his his armies, uh, and this speaks of his power, his power to deliver, his power to accomplish whatever he desires. And Zechariah mentions or refers to God as the Lord of hosts some fifty times in his in his book here. Um so that's that's what he's intending to convey that this is a God of power and he's fully capable of accomplishing whatever he determines to do. 2a, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Again, he's doubling down on this name, okay, uh, for emphasis of his power, delivering and uh, preserving power. Uh, 2b, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy and I was jealous for her with great fury. Now, this may be a little concerning or confusing for for some uh, students uh, when it says that God was jealous because <clears throat> in our culture, jealousy has a very negative connotation. But uh, when it's used in reference to God, it is not speaking of uh, the kind of jealousy uh, we think of uh, when we use that word or when we hear that word, uh, a boy is jealousy, uh, jealous of a, a girl's uh, <clears throat> uh, flirting with another guy or something like that, or a, a, a man being jealous of his wife's uh, attention, giving attention to some other man. Uh, no, it's not speaking of that. It it really can be translated, the, the word translated jealousy could be translated zeal. Uh, and it speaks of uh, a, um, a great passion uh, or zeal. Uh, uh, and in this case, it, it speaks of God's commitment uh his to to protect and to um to care for um and it it's a it's a, a zealous vigilance and, and when it says he uh he is zealous with great fury this speaks of the fervency of this zeal uh and also uh, it, 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 it it suggests that God is, uh, uh, is angry with those who would hurt uh, his people, those he cares for and those he is protecting. So again, in verse 2, he's saying, this is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of uh, the mighty God. He is saying he is, has zeal uh, for the protection of uh, his people. Verse 3a, thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. All right, this is speaking about, again, the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, I did refer you to Ezra chapter 4. If you read Ezra chapter 4, verse 24 two through 5, uh, 2, the first couple of verses in chapter 5 of Ezra speak of the resumption of the construction of the of the temple some um 15, uh, some 16 years after they laid the foundation and again that was under the reign of Darius and I don't know that Artaxerxes when he said uh when he, when the work ceased uh with rebuilding the city and certainly the wall that that necessarily applied to the temple. 
However, the Jews stopped work on the temple as well. And as I said earlier, uh, it uh, did not resume for some 16 years. Uh, 3B says, so, so God is talking about him returning. What is, he, he, he means once the temple is reconstructed, uh, his presence will be symbolized in their midst as it was before. The temple was a symbol of God's presence among them. And of course, with it being in ruins, uh, obviously that suggested that uh, there was no symbol, if you will, of his presence. So he says he's going to be in the midst of them. Verse uh, 3b, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. Okay, so here he's talking about giving Jerusalem a new name. Okay, Jerusalem is now going to be a city of loyalty and trustworthiness. Uh, whereas um, it had developed uh, a reputation before uh, the uh, before the exile of uh, just the opposite. So now it's going to be known for its trustworthiness, and uh, we'll say more about that as we progress through the lesson. But three C says, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts. The holy mountain. So again, this is another name for Jerusalem. And this is perhaps speaking of the Temple Mount more specifically uh, than uh, Jerusalem in general. The Temple Mount, where the uh, mountain is. And we know that uh, the use of Zion, Mount Zion, uh, sometimes refers to just the Temple area. But in other cases, all of Jerusalem. So when it says it's going to be uh, holy, it means it's going to be sanctified. It's going to be set apart for God's use, for God's purposes. Verse 4, thus said the Lord of hosts, there shall be yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. Now, I know that's fairly clear but let's just read that one very quickly quickly from the niv verse 4 from the niv this is what the lord almighty says once again men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of jerusalem each of them with cain in hand because of their age now what does that suggest it suggests that uh <clears throat> there's going to be peace uh uh, you know, the only time, uh, the only way I should say, uh, people uh, live long enough to get old and feeble and, and need canes is if uh, there's an absence of strife and war and, and poverty uh, in the land. Uh, if there are those things in the land, uh, the most vulnerable and the weakest are the ones that usually succumb to it first. So he's speaking of the fact that people are going to grow old and so that's speaking of the peace that God is going to provide in Jerusalem. Uh, and then verse 5 says, And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. So he is now looking at the other extreme, the youngest among the people, which are also weak and vulnerable, will be playing in the streets, which will mean that there'll be an absence of war and strife and poverty. Uh, they'll be playing in the streets. So he's saying from the youngest to the oldest, uh, people will be protected. People will be uh, living uh, lives free from strife and war and from God's judgment. They'll be safe from harm. And this is, again... Because God is returned. He's in the midst of them. Okay, as he said in verse 3. Verse 6. Thus said the Lord of hosts. Again, uh, speaking of his might, uh, the almighty God. If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of the people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes, said the Lord of hosts. Now, what's he saying there? You know, he's saying, if what I'm doing or going to do uh, is going to seem miraculous in the eyes of the citizens of the people of Jerusalem, 
Is it, I mean, should it seem miraculous to me? Is it anything uh, that's too difficult for me? Uh, that's kind of a, that, that's a rhetorical question, and certainly it's not. It's nothing for him to do what seems miraculous in our eyes. In fact, what is miraculous in our eyes is nothing for God to do. It is nothing that God cannot do. All things are possible with God. And uh, and, and that's what he's, he's, he's saying. He's saying, again, uh, by using the Lord of hosts, is speaking of his might to accomplish whatever he desires to accomplish. And that's something we need to we need to keep in mind always ourselves. I mean, uh, concerning concerning this uh, coronavirus, this COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, we need to always keep in mind that God is in full control. God knows exactly uh, what the uh, origin uh, or, 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 origin, I should say, and what the end of this virus would be. It, this virus might have taken the world by surprise, but it certainly did not take God by surprise. And so we need to keep that in mind. He is fully in control and he can stay this thing tomorrow. Uh, and it will seem marvelous in our eyes, but certainly it is certainly not any marvel for God to accomplish. Verse seven, thus said the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. Now, whenever you hear uh, extremes like that from the east from the west from the north and the south, uh, God is speaking of the omnibus uh, nature of what he's going to do, the completeness. So now he's talking about uh, bringing, uh, saving his people and in this context, save or salvation uh, is not the spiritual salvation uh, that we are familiar with and those uh, that's spoken of very often in the New Testament, but it's speaking of a deliverance uh, from uh, an enemy, a deliverance from uh, punishment, from judgment, uh, it is, and, and it's a liberation from a foreign oppressor. This is what it's speaking of in this context. And, and the basic word salvation is, is really translated from a word that means deliverance. We know our spiritual salvation involves deliverance from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and ultimately from the very presence of sin. Uh, those three tenses are used in our salvation, our spiritual salvation. Now, it's believed that <clears throat> this passage may be suggesting a future deliverance. Uh, certainly, uh, a remnant has returned from Babylon, but uh, with the broadness of this deliverance he's talking about, it's, it's, uh, it suggests that this is a future yet deliverance of all God's people. Uh, and we are among those, by the way. Uh, verse 8, and I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Now, um, I'm going to read a couple sentences from the uh, quarterly uh, commentary here and it says reflecting on these promises to Israel provides hope for a better future for those who are his children. Christ's redemptive ministry, he dwells in each of us through the Holy Spirit. The new name for his people is the redeemed. We have eternal peace and security, and we are assured of dwelling with him in the new Jerusalem. So the saying that to say the ultimate fulfillment of this uh, prophecy of Zacharias is in the church or through the church. But he is talking about bringing uh, Jews uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the near term uh, in the midst of Jerusalem in his where his presence is now. And he is... Uh, talking about the characteristics 
that they are going to have being in the midst of Jerusalem and in his presence. Uh, characteristics of truth and righteousness, recognizing, understanding the truth uh, in the word of God. And of course, righteousness doing what is right in the sight of God. Now we're going to move to the second division of the quarterly commentary, which is entitled Reversed Fortunes. Reverse Fortunes, verses 11 through 13 in the KJV. But now I will not be unto the residue or remnant of this people as in the former days, said the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous, or the descendants or offspring shall be prosperous. The vine shall give her fruit, and the ground, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I mean actual grain, not, not offspring. <laughs> Verse 12. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their dew, or rain, and I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. Verse 13, And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. All right, let's back up to verse 11. Let's go verse by verse here. And here again, uh, it, it it really helps to give some context to this passage. If you read Haggai verse uh, chapter one, verses one to eleven, verse eleven says, "But now I will not be unto the residue or remnant of this people as in the former days," saith the Lord of hosts. What? How was he? And what were the former days? Well, he was uh, withholding uh, rain. Uh, he, in fact, let me just pull a few pa uh, verses from that passage I just referred to in Haggai chapter 1. Uh, he says, uh, I'm going to just back up to uh, verse 6. And it says, Ye have so much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he hath, he that hath earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye look for much, and lo, it came to little. This is verse 9. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Verse 10. Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew or rain, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And finally, verse 11, and I call for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of their hands. That is the what he did before. And the before was during the 16 years between the laying of the foundation of the temple a rebuilding of the foundation and the resumption of the rebuilding of the temple. So that's what he's saying. The former days or those 16 years, saith the Lord of hosts, the Lord almighty. Verse 12, for the seed shall be prosperous. The vine shall give her fruit and the ground shall give her increase and the heavens shall give their dew or rain and I will cause the remnant of the people to possess all these things. So what is he saying? He's basically going to reverse the curse. When, while they were dithering or, or uh, procrastinating about completing the temple, God judged them. 
uh, was judging them. And now he's saying he's going to not only end that judgment, he's going to reverse what he was doing before. He's going to cause them to increase, cause the land to be fruitful, bring the rain, bring the increase of their crops, and so forth. Now, uh, what, what, is this, what does this say here, I mean, to us? You know, um, it speaks of uh, God's priority and the priority we, his people, should have. I mean, we should put God before everything. You know, when we, uh, you know, it, it said, it's often said, you know, you can tell about a person's uh, spiritual life by looking at their checkbook. Uh, and, and I think there's, there's a lot uh, true, uh, there's a lot of truth in that, you know, where are their priorities? In fact, how they spend their time uh, generally, you know, is it for their just consumed on their own pleasure and their own selfish needs and their own selfish desires, I should say, or do you see uh, them devoting the best, uh, the best of their time, talent, and treasure to the Lord? And that's what he desires of us today. And I, I often say uh, to my grandchildren now, um, you know, if, if you want to be blessed of the Lord, as the Lord has promised to bless his people, and I'm just I'm not just talking about material blessings. Obviously, God give us He can give us great contentment in whatever state we find ourselves, and great peace and joy, even in the midst of great trials. Uh, we need to be in the place of blessing, and the place of blessing is being obedient, being faithful, being worshipful, uh, recognizing Him as the first, uh, uh, giving Him the highest priority in our lives. So the first thing the Jews should have done on their return was completed the temple, uh, began to uh, re return to the, uh, the, the worship uh, and sacrif sacrificial services uh, that God had required of them. Uh, let's go on to 13. And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. All right, so he's talking to all of Israel. When he talks about the house of Judah and the house of Israel, he's speaking about the southern, about the divided kingdom, the southern kingdom of Judah, and what had been the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, obviously, these are scattered, but God knows certainly where each of them them were, but he's, he's speaking of the entirety of uh, his people, uh, Israel. And he is saying they were, he's, he's saying just as, and he's actually reversing uh, things here, but he's saying just as uh, you were a curse, uh, he's saying to, to who? You were cursed among the heathen. God intended for his people to be uh, ambassadors, uh, his ambassadors to not only those immediately around them, but to the world. He wanted the people to see him, his righteousness, his righteous judgments and laws and standards for living. Uh, and not uh, what they had become idolatrous and, and sinful and practices of all kinds of sins and loathsome in his own eyes. And ultimately the object of his judgment when he had first the northern kingdom uh, taken captive by Assyria and dispersed and then the southern kingdom taken captive by Babylon. He spoke of his judgment and of course, that didn't do anything for God's reputation. It didn't do anything positive for God's reputation to have disobedient people that he had to judge in such a manner before the heathen. But now he's talking about making them a blessing. Now they're going to um, reflect the true character of God to these nations around, to the heathen around them, to the unbelievers, as we should. Uh, when we were delivered from bondage to sin, when we were made new creatures in Christ, uh, we began, or we certainly should have began to reflect Christ 
in the sin sick and dying world, in this dark world that we're in. We were brought out of darkness into light, and now we should reflect light back into the darkness. Uh, John 8, 12 says, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And that light should be ref a reflection of him in the darkness of our world today. And finally, he says, fear not, but be, but let your hands be strong. You know, when we are fearing, our hands are feeble and weak. Uh, but he's saying, firm, uh, uh, he said, uh, strengthen yourself and get ready to work. He's talking about renewing um, one's power and motivation to act. And in this case, to act in the, in the right way. Uh, uh, with power, uh, with, with having been encouraged, and with confidence in the service of God. Okay, not doing those things to serve our own needs, our own selfish needs, our desires, but doing the service of God. Verse 14. Now, actually, we're beginning the third division from the quarterly, which is entitled Divine Confirmation, Divine Confirmation. So let me just read verses 14 through 17. For thus said the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, said the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. So again, have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear ye not. These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And then verse 17. And let none of you, you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath for all these things that I hate saith the Lord. All these rather are things that I hate, saith the Lord. So let's back up to 14 again. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, again, oh, the mighty, almighty God, as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, and this is concerning uh, their, uh, the, the wickedness idolatry and other wickedness that they practiced that ultimately led to their uh, being exiled uh, to Babylon and again uh, also Assyria. Uh, and then he's the, so he's talking about the fathers that uh, of course lived before the exiles. Uh, they provoked him to wrath and 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 he says, uh, Seth the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. Now, uh, we generally think of this word repent. In fact, it has several meanings, the most common of which is, met, is, come, is derived from the word metanoia, which means to have a change of heart and mind. And, and when it's used in, in connection with God, when God says he repented or repented not, it is not speaking about him having a change of mind. God knows what he's going to do and what he's not going to do. Uh, uh, and, and does not change. He's immutable. He does not change. But in this case, it this word is also translated comfort. It can be translated sorrow. It can be translated comfort. And it said, it, this did not comfort the Lord. Uh, it did not, he was not, he took no comfort in this, in, in uh, the judgment uh, that was a result of him being provoked to wrath. Uh, verse 15, so again, uh, have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. So what's he saying between those two verses? He said, as I was determined to punish you uh, for your sins because you provoked me to wrath, uh, I was deliberate about it. I warned you about it. You go back to Deuteronomy 28. You can go back to all the warnings that I gave you uh, through the prophets, and I made good on my promise to judge you because of your sin. He's saying, as I did that, I am equally determined to uh, do well unto Jerusalem. And he's talking about the people now. 
and the house of Judah. He's uh, again, that's a, a couplet there. He's talking about Jerusalem as a the place and people and the house of Judah, certainly as the people. And he's telling them not to fear, not to fear what? Not to fear further judgment, not to fear further punishment. Now, obviously, he's going to give them uh, some expectations here uh, in, in the last verse. But right now he's telling them, don't fear any further punishment as I as I promised in Jeremiah, for example, chapter four, verses 27 and 28. And that really reveals God's resolute intention to punish his people, his covenant people for their sin. So let's look at verse, uh, let's wrap up, look at verses 16 and 17 together. And they read, these are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment uh, of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath, for all these are things that I hate saith the Lord. Now, um, the standard, I'm sorry, the quarterly commentator really breaks this down well, I think. He says, uh, you know, um, if met, they would reflect spiritual uh, genuineness rather than hypocritical religiosity. These are expectations that God set, specific expectations that accompany um, his promise of uh, restoring them and uh, being in their midst and protecting them and uh, basically doing well by them, as he said in verse 15. Uh, and he basically uh, breaks them down uh, by uh, five specific expectations. And the first is the people were to demonstrate integrity in their relationships with each other. Okay, second, and, and, and here's the thing, you know, how do, how do we serve God? And I, I know I'm getting a little long here, but how do we serve God? I mean, God doesn't need anything from us. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our compassion. Uh, he doesn't, he needs our faith in him. Certainly he wants us to love him, uh, appreciate what he does for us. But we demonstrate our love for God by serving others. You know, the cattle on a thousand hills are gods. You know, John, uh, first John chapter four tells us, you know, hey, uh, how can you say that you love God who you cannot see when you don't love your brother who you can see? You know, so we serve God through serving others. We demonstrate our honesty and our sincerity uh, uh, in our relationships one with another. Second, he says equity and truth were the character were to characterize judgments made, and this is just not on a personal level. Uh, in the passage I just read, a couple of verses I just said, he says, "Judgment and truth and peace in your gates." Now, we those of you biblical scholars out there know that the gates were usually, I mean, at the entrance to the city, and and that it's where where the leaders uh, of the city executed judgment. People brought matters, uh, great and small, uh, to be heard and to be judged at the gates. So he's saying as a as a, uh, a civic matter, you are to execute judgment and certainly, uh, and truth, and certainly in your personal relationships, one with another. They are to be characterized by truth and good judgment or righteous judgment. Third, None of them were to devise evil in their hearts against their neighbor. This is any kind of evil. I mean, covetousness, uh, this is any kind of evil. Try to do them some harm. Uh, try to lie uh, and gossip about them. Any kind of, of harm against their neighbor. And that certainly applies to us today. We are commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. That is the second great commandment. Uh, fourth, they were to avoid a love for perjury or false oaths. 
Uh, that's lying. Basically, we're we are not to lie. We are not to uh, uh, love deceiving people uh, about any matter. And then finally, they were expected to hate all that God hated. Now, if you want a you want a good standard for your behavior, uh, you just don't do what God hates. You just hate what He hates. You know, He hates sin. He hates covetousness he hates all manner of sin and if you just hate what he hates and and restrict your behavior to those things that he loves that he delights in and doesn't hate then you'll have a good standard for your christian conduct now uh we are again running long here and i i, I apologize for that sometimes i get carried away but i I do believe in, in, in expository teaching, and that's going verse by verse to expose the meaning of each verse in the context of the passage. And I hope that we've done that. Now, what does it mean to us? What are our takeaways? Again, uh, we are uh, we learn more about God's character in this passage, about his forgiveness, about his willingness to forgive, uh, about him exhorting. You know, he sent Haggai... And he sent uh, Zechariah to exhort his people. And, of course, they worked along with uh, Zerubbabel, uh, who was the uh, then civic uh, leader at that time, and Joshua, who was the high priest at that time, in exhorting the people to get back to what was important to God, okay? Uh, we can get so bogged down in in trying to, uh, in, in, with our concern about our own personal and selfish needs, that we neglect God, you know? And as I've said many times uh, in, in the past to, to various people, you know, when, when, when the Bible speaks of the godless, uh, it is not necessarily speaking about the most despicable sinner uh, you can imagine, uh, it is speaking about those people who just don't regard God in their daily living. They just go about their lives as if God didn't exist. God wants preeminence in our lives. And, of course, that less, this is a lesson that teaches us that. And then we, we see what God and God has promised to protect us, to provide for us, uh, to increase us. And But he has expectation of us, which I just read. And I hope that uh, uh, the lesson was clear. And we're going to say, we pray that God will bless you and keep you till such time as we meet again.